Hello everyone, welcome to Brain Blitz Audios. In today's episode of Mind Maps, we'll be dealing with the chapter Units and Measurements. Now this chapter is the second chapter in the physics syllabus of grade 11 CBSE. And in order to expound on this chapter, we've enlisted the help of a mind map. Now mind maps are really helpful in preparing for last minute revisions before the exams. However, they can be pretty extensive and therefore this video is devoted to explaining this mind map in some detail. So first we'll be looking at units and measurements, the basic overview, then we'll look at what is a unit and then types and then properties and system of units. And after dealing with properties and system of units, We'll be moving on to measurement and its various facets such as precision, accuracy, errors, the types of errors, combination of errors, significant figures, and dimensions of physical quantities. So these are all the topics that we'll be dealing with today. So let's move on to our first part, unit. So what is a unit? So a unit is basically defined as the arbitrarily chosen, basic, internationally accepted reference standard used to compare physical quantities for their measurement. So comparison with a certain internationally accepted reference standard is called as a unit. And the reference standard refers to the system of units that people use. So in today's world, we have many, many units around us denoting many, many physical quantities. For example, force is given in newtons, pressure is given in pascals, and power is given in watts, etc. So we have a lot of units around us which represent a lot of physical quantities. However, when we look at this plethora of units, we can basically divide them into three types. And these are the types that we'll be looking forward to next. So the first type is known as fundamental units. So the first type is fundamental units. So a fundamental unit is basically a representation of the standard of, a, of the seven basic physical quantities. So we have a lot of physical quantities, but there are seven quantities which are basic from which all the other quantities are derived. Now these are mass, length, time, temperature, electric current, luminous intensity, and amount of substance. So the units for these seven quantities are known as fundamental units. And these fundamental units are used to derive the other units in the coming chapter. So these are the seven fundamental units, kilogram for mass, meter for length, second for time, Kelvin for temperature, ampere for electric current, candela for luminous intensity, and moles of the constituents such as atoms, molecules, or formulae, etc., for the amount of substance. So that is all about fundamental units. The next type of unit is called as a derived unit. So derived units are the units which are derived from fundamental units. So for example, the quantity speed is measured in meters per second. Now the unit meters per second is derived from the division of distance, which is represented in meters, divided by time, which is measured in seconds. So this quantity or this unit, meters per second, is derived from the fundamental units, meter and second, which represents distance and time respectively. So this is how we formed form derived units. So these can be formed from fundamental units, or they can be formed from other derived units. Now, 
there is a third kind of unit. Now, these kind of units are not derivable and they do not represent the seven basic quantities. So these are other than the seven basic quantities. And so this third type of unit is referred to as a supplementary unit. A supplementary unit is a unit of a supplementary physical quantity. So these supplementary quantities include the angles, plane angle and solid angle. Now, plane angle is an angle in a plane and solid angle is an angle present in a 3D object, such as a sphere or a cone or a cylinder, etc. So, plane angle is measured in radians and the solid angle is measured in steradians. So, these are the two supplementary units. So, having looked at the types of units which are fundamental, derived, and supplementary, let's look at some properties of units and some systems of units that we have used over the years. So, properties. The first property is universal acceptance. So, what it means is that a system is and the system of units around the world is the same. So one system of units is used all over the world for measurement. So that is known as universal acceptance. It is a property of a successful unit. The second property is non-perishable. So what that means is that the unit does not get altered. So Suppose a unit is defined as in, in some form of definition. So if a unit is non-perishable, then that definition does not change with time, leading to an alteration of the unit. Now, an example where this happened is for the kilogram, which is the SI unit for mass. So for years, we used to have a platinum iridium alloy cylinder called Lagrange K or the big K as the standard unit of the kilogram. However, in recent years, we found that this platinum iridium alloy started losing its mass after successive measurements. And so therefore, it was discarded as the unit for the kilogram and it started and the kilogram is now defined with respect to, you know, the Planck's constant and the other uh, constants referring to mass and energy. So so the new unit for the kilogram does not perish and that's why it's a non-perishable unit now the third property is well defined now well defined units are defined using very static physical phenomena so for so if a unit is defined by something that's happening then its value does not change its value is well defined so after doing the same experiment we can also find out the value of the unit if we do it correctly. And the fourth unit is saying that it, the unit does not change with time. This again is referring to the second unit, which is non-perishable. So the, the experiment that we use to define a unit should not yield different results at different times. The result should always be constant. And that's what's meant by the fourth property. A unit does not change with time. So, in previous years, in previous decades, we've had many systems of units in different countries. So earlier, each country used to have a different system of units. And therefore, we used to have a lot of confusion with regards to communication. And so therefore, we've now decided to use one single unit. But we still have a lot of other units, unit systems in use. So one of them is called the CGS unit system. So over here, the fundamental quantities are mass, I mean length, mass, and time. So length is in centimeters, mass is in grams, and time is in seconds. For FPS, which is the British system, the length is measured in foots, the mass is measured in pounds, and time is measured in seconds. 
for MKS, length is in meters, mass is in kilograms, time is in seconds, and the fourth type, which is known as SI, now SI stands for System International, which is French for International System of Units. Now this units was adopted in 1971 and ever since it has been internationally accepted. And this was found at the General Conference on Weights and Measures, where a group of independent scientists decided to use the SI unit. And the reason why they use the SI unit is that it is based on the decimal system and therefore you can easily convert the quantities. And so using the SI units have made the SI system as the universally accepted system. Now we still have people using CGS, FPS and MKS. However, for scientific and research purposes, we always use the SI units. And the SI units were the ones that we gave above in our examples for types of units. So the seven fundamental quantities each had their own SI unit given in the earlier slide. Now, we've had a thorough discussion on units, types of units, properties of units, and the various systems of units in use. So units are what we use are what uh, is the international standard that we use to measure objects. But what is exactly measurement? Let's dive deep into that. Now, measurement is comparing the physical quantities with its international standard or unit. So when we compare some physical quantity, for example, I want to compare the length of this line. Now, according to the international system of units, I might say this as, say, five centimeters. This measures five centimeters. With a different system of units, I may have some other value. So when we measure this line, what we're essentially doing is we're comparing this quantity with its internationally accepted standard. So we're basically dividing it into many parts of a reference standard. And thus, we're finding out the value of a physical quantity such as length. Now, when we're doing measurement, we use measurements in all kinds of quantities, such as length, mass, and time. And these are varied measurements that we use. Even for example, of, for example, length, we can measure the length of the radius of the of a proton, which is one of the smallest subatomic sub particles, and we can also measure the radius of the universe. So we have a vast plethora of measurements to be done. In in terms of mass, the the least mass that we have done is the mass of an electron, and the greatest mass that we've measured is the mass mass of the observable universe. Again, estimated. And with respect to time. Now, time taken for particle decay is one of the shortest periods that we know of. And the period of the entire known universe, which is the billions of years ago, what the Big Bang happened, et cetera, et cetera, that is one of the highest units of measuring time. So we're using measurements in order to quantify the world around us, in order to find out where, what, and how it happened. So measurement of physical quantities is very, very important. Now, measurement itself has two factors. And the reason why it has two factors is that when we are measuring, we're, in, we are using the help of instruments in order to quantify our, um, our given sample. Like for example, five centimeters, I can use a ruler to find that out. I can also use a vernier caliper or any other instrument in order to find that out. So when we're using our instruments, there are two factors that we take into account. And these factors are known as accuracy and precision. Now let's start with accuracy. Accuracy is defined as the closeness of the measured value to the true value. Now, for example, I have a stick and the stick measures 10 centimeter. Now using the scale, you got the measured value as 10.5 centimeter. And using, the, using some other form 
of measurement, you you got 9.1. And using a Werner caliper, which is close to exact, you got 9.9 .9 centimeters. So we've got three measured values, and we need to find out which of these is more accurate. So we find that 9.9 .9 centimeter is closest to the actual value of the length of the stick, which is 10 centimeters. So that means that the measurement using the Werner caliper is more accurate because it is closer to the true value. So the true value is given as 10 centimeters. And since the measured value 9.9 .9 is closer to it, we say that it is more accurate. Now that is accuracy. How do you define precision? Precision is the limit of resolution of a quantity measured. Now, how do we understand this? Let's say we have that same stick and we have its length is 10 centimeters. After measuring with a vernier caliper, you found its length to be 9.82 centimeters. And after using a screw gauge, you found that its length is 9.86 five centimeters. Now, if you look at it, both of these are fairly accurate. However, there's a big difference between the two units and that's the resolution. So here we have the measurement up to three decimal places when using the screw gauge, but when using the vernier caliper, we only have a resolution up to two decimal places. So when we have an increase in the resolution of the measured quantity, we say that the measurement is more precise. Now, in common usages, more accurate measurements are maybe more precise. However, the vice versa is not true. So a precise value can still be inaccurate. Like for example, we used 9.865 in the second scenario to find the measured value for a stick of 10 centimeters. However, it is still not as accurate as our original measurement of 9.9 .9 centimeters. So you see that in the, in the second case, there is still more precision. However, there's less accuracy. So accuracy and precision are two very different things and sometimes they're 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 fairly related but not always so accuracy and precision does not have a solid relation so something that is more accurate may be less precise than another having said that let's move on to errors and types of errors so when we measure with physical instruments in order to measure physical quantities, the result always has some uncertainty. And this uncertainty is referred to as an error of measurement. In our previous example, the true value of the stick was 10 centimeters. However, we got the most accurate value to be 9.9 .9 centimeters. Our result, while being the most accurate, still had some uncertainty. And that uncertainty, that difference between the true value and the measured value is referred to as an error. Now, in the basic sense, an error is the difference between the true value of something and the measured value. Like for example, for our stick, the two values 10 centimeter and the measured value is say 9.1 centimeter. So you have an error of 0.9 centimeters. So this is error as in its most basic form. Now errors can be classified as systematic and random. Systematic errors tend to be in one or the other direction. They can either be positive or negative. An example being the displacement of the zero mark to a positive end or a negative end. And, and another example is measuring body temperature under the armpit when we know that 
the temperature in the armpit is actually lesser than the body temperature. And when we uh, try to measure something, we if we have some prejudice towards leaning our head towards the right, then we have an error due to parallax, which is the apparent displacement of the object due to our difference in viewpoint. So these are all the types of errors which are systematic. That means they occur in one direction. However, random errors are irregular, unpredictable errors, and they happen in unpredictable conditions. For example, when we're measuring something, we have a sudden fluctuation in wind speed or current or voltage. These are random errors, and we cannot basically control them. Systematic errors can be rectified through practice. Now, these are the basic types of errors. However, when it comes to representation, there are other types of errors as well. The first type of error is known as the absolute error. Now, what is an absolute error? Absolute error is the magnitude of difference. Now, if you remember, we told you that error is the difference between the true value of a measured quantity and its measured value. So the true value of a quantity minus measured value of that same quantity gives you the error in measurement. The absolute error gives you the magnitude of that difference. So an absolute error is defined as the magnitude of difference between the individual measurement and true value of a quantity. And it is represented by the formula delta a n is equal to a n minus a mean. So delta a n refers to absolute error. A n is measured quantity. And a mean here represents the true value. Now, when we usually do experiments, we take about four or five observations. And a mean, which is the average of all these observations, is usually consider the true value. And so therefore, a mean, which is the true value, has the formula a1 plus a2 plus etc plus a n divided by n. So this is just an average. So that is the first way in which we can represent errors. We can represent them actual magnitude by using absolute error. However, we can also represent an error by its relative form as a ratio of the absolute error divided by the quantity. And that is what is relative error. Relative error is the ratio of the mean absolute error to the mean value of the quantity. So mean absolute error is defined as delta a mean and the mean, quant the mean value of the quantity, which is the true value, is represented as a mean. And the reason why we use delta a mean is because the true value is the average. So we've took the average of the individual errors in order to find the mean absolute error. And we also have a formula here that is describing the same. So delta A mean is delta A1 plus delta A2 plus et cetera plus delta A n divided by n. So again, an average. So that is relative error. However, in most questions, we usually get percentages of errors. And that kind of error is known as a percentage error. And that is basically a relative error expressed in percentages. So for example, if we have in this scenario, our error, absolute error is 0.1 and the true value is 10. When we multiply this relative error with 100, we get 10% as the percentage error of our measurement of the length of the stick. So Percentage error is basically a relative error multiplied by 100, according to this formula. And relative error is measured as delta A mean divided by A mean. So these are the types of errors that we need to study about, because these are the types of errors that are commonly asked. So they will ask you either the actual magnitude or relative error and percentage error. Now, these are usually found in applications of the chapter units and measurements. So, so far, we've discussed about errors in an individual physical quantity. 
So for example, the length of a stick, I measured the same like four or five times, and then I found its mean value, the true value, and then I found the individual errors. This is for one single quantity. However, in daily life, what we usually have is a combination of errors. So we do experiments with combinations of different quantities, and with our measurements, each quantity will have an error. So therefore, we will need to find out how to combine errors together. So combination of errors is defined for three scenarios. The first scenario is sum or difference. So when we have two physical quantities, A plus delta A and B plus delta B, where delta A and delta B re represent the errors in measurement, and we need to find the value of the quantity Z. So Z will also have an error plus minus delta Z. So when adding or subtracting A and B, we'll get the value Z, but how do we find out the actual error? Because we have errors here in two different quantities, but we need to find out the error of the quantity Z. So this is where we first combine the errors. So for two physical quantities A and B, which are added or subtracted, their errors are also added or subtracted. So over here we have A plus or minus delta A and B plus or minus delta B. And on adding or subtracting A and B, you're getting Z. So the value of the error delta Z will be equal to plus minus delta A plus minus delta B. Delta A plus minus delta B. So that is how you represent the combination of error in the presence of the arithmetic operations, addition and subtraction. So for addition and subtraction, we use the individual operator. So if we have to find out delta Z, then when Z is Z is a resultant, then we add delta A and delta B. If it's for subtraction, we subtract delta A and delta B. Now notice here we have a plus or minus in the place of delta Z. So this refers to the sign, and over here the plus or minus refers to the operator. So that is one way of combining errors. Now, the second type is multiplication or division. So in most of the scenarios, we'll have two physical quantities A and B. Now these are multiplied or divided, and we need to find out the error of the resultant. So how do we do it? So for A, let's say delta A is its error, and for B, let's say delta B is its error. So for multiplication and division, we represent the errors in the form of relative error, whether it be for the components A and B or the result in Z. So we use relative error in order in combining errors in multiplication or division. So if two physical quantities A and B are multiplied or divided in order to get a, a number or a value Z, then the, then the relative error of Z is equal to the sum of the relative errors of A and B. So that means delta Z by Z is equal to delta A by A plus delta B by B. So this formula stays the same for both multiplication and division because we're using the relative error, which in both cases stays the same. So therefore, delta Z by Z is equal to delta A by A plus delta B by B remains the same for both multiplication and division. It's unlike the previous scenario where we had to change this, change the operator if the, if the operator is changing. So if it's A plus B, then we have to do delta A plus delta B. And for minus, it'll be delta A minus delta B. But over here, there's nothing of that sort. It's just delta Z by Z is equal to delta A by A plus delta B by B. And the formula stays the same for multiplication and division. 
However, there is a third scenario, which is an extension of the second scenario, which is measured quantity raised to the power. So over here, we're seeing that a quantity Z is the multiplication and division of quantities A, B, and C raised to respective powers. For A, it's P, for B, it's Q, and for C, it's R. How do you measure the errors? Again, we use relative error, but with a slight twist. Now, A raised to P is A into P, A into A into A into A, P times. So it's the multiplication of A by itself, P times. So what we do is instead of writing delta A by A plus delta A by A, etc., P times, we just multiply P to delta A by A. So the relative error of A is multiplied with the power of that quantity. So delta Z by Z will be equal to P into delta A by A plus Q into delta B by B plus R into delta, delta C by C. P, Q, and R will have respective signs, so the formula may vary in different scenarios because of the sign of P, Q, and R. Other than that, the formula still sticks the same. The only difference that we had is we just multiplied the power of the individual quantity to its relative error. And that gives us the formula of combination of errors when we have raised quantities. So these are the three ways in which we combine errors. Now, in a measurement, we will always have certain and uncertain values due to the difference in accuracy and precision of our measurements. So measurements can have certain and uncertain values. Now, when we study significant figures, what we're essentially doing is we're representing the number with its certain digits. So it contains all certain digits and the first uncertain digit. And for example, let's say I have measured time to 1.62 seconds. So here one and six are certain digits, while two is the first uncertain digit. So this is how we represent physical quantities and their measurements in terms of significant figures. Now, there are many rules. There are some rules in order to identify significant figures. So, significant figures have the following rules. The first thing, all non-zero digits of any measured quantity are significant figures. Now, for example, in 0, 2, 0, 3, 4, 2.010, the numbers, two, the digits 2, 3, 4, 2, and 1 are all significant because they are non-zero. The next rule says that all zeros between two non-zero digits are significant. So for example, the zero between two and three and the zero between two and one are significant because they are present in between two non-zero digits. The third property says that if the number is less than one, the zeros on the right of the decimal point but to the left of the non-zero non -zero digit are not significant. So like, for example, we have 0 0.00038. So what it says is that this number is less than one. So therefore these zeros are not significant. And the final rule states that the terminal or trailing zeros in a number without a decimal point are not significant. So for instance, we can say that, suppose we have 12 meters of wire, and if we represent it as 1200 centimeters, the significant figures would still be one and two. However, if we had 12.00 meters, then both of these zeros are also significant. So terminal or trailing zeros and a number with decimal points are significant. Without decimal points, they're not significant. So these are the rules 
by which we find out the significant figures of a measured quantity. So significant figures are very, very important in terms of operations, arithmetic operations. So therefore, for other arithmetic operations, there are some rules. If you're multiplying or dividing something, any physical, in any two physical quantities, then the result should have the same, phys the same significant figures as that of the number with least significant figures. So for example, say 10.0 divided by 2.2. .2. So over here, we had these as the significant figures. And for 2.2, .2, it's just two significant figures. So the result of this division must have only two significant figures. Now, for addition and subtraction, the game gets a little tricky. Now, if something, is, now if two quantities are added or subtracted, what we do is we, we should ensure that the final result should retain as many decimal places. So for example, we have 10.1 plus 2.002 then the final answer should only have one decimal point. We have to round off the other digits so that the result should have one decimal point. So for addition and subtraction, it, it is dependent on the decimal places, the least number of decimal places, and for multiplication and division, it is the least number of significant figures. So that is how significant figures play a key role in arithmetic operations. Now, when we're doing this, we always, we usually get confusions. So what we do is we use scientific notations. So scientific notations will have the significant figures and powers. So it will have significant figures and powers of 10. So we measure any physical quantity and we use scientific notation in order to get out, in order to find out which of these significant figures are actually present. Now, because of the third and fourth law, people usually get confused when we're using the normal method. So they use scientific notation in order to give you the correct amount of significant figures and the resolution by powers of 10. So that is how you find out these that is how significant figures of a physical quantity play a very crucial role. Now, in the beginning of this chapter, we've discussed that there are only seven fundamental units. However, there are many, many different physical quantities. So how do we measure these other physical quantities? Now, all of these physical quantities can be represented as a relation of one or more fundamental quantities. Now we, we've discussed that mass, length, time, electric current, and luminous intensity, amount of substance, and temperature are the seven fundamental quantities. So all of the other physical quantities that's present around us can be expressed as a relation of one or more of these seven fundamental quantities. And that is how we reach, a di we reach the topic dimensional formula. So a dimensional formula is an expression which shows how and which of the base quantities represent the dimensions of a physical quantity. And because since the derived units are dependent on the fundamental units, the derived quantities will be dependent on the fundamental quantities. So this relation will be shown to you in a dimensional formula. Now, say we want to find out the dimensional formula of force. Now, according to Newton's second law, we know that force is mass times acceleration, 
However, we can represent acceleration as velocity by time. We can, all, we can represent velocity as distance divided by time, all divided by time. So that gives you distance, mass times distance divided by time squared. And that is how you get the dimensional formula for force as m l t power minus 2. So since we have seven basic quantities, we will also have seven dimensions. M stands for mass, L stands for length, T stands for time, K stands for temperature, A stands for <clears throat> A stands for um, electric current, and C D stands for luminous intensity, candela, and mole stands for amount of substance. So these are the seven dimensions. And what we do is we represent all kinds of equations and quantities and other types of relations using these dimensions. So dimensional formula is useful is when we check the dimensions or consistency of equations. Suppose we have some equations, we need to find out whether the equation is wrong or not. So if the equation when we uh, put dimensional analysis into it, and then we find that the dimensions do not match, then we say that the equation is wrong. However, if the dimensions do match, then we move on to the next step of analysis to find out whether the constants are equal or not. It is so we can use dimensional formula as a method of analysis in order to check the consistency of equations. And that is how we use dimensional analysis using the seven fundamental quantities. And so that ends this episode of Mind Maps, where we looked at the chapter units and measurements, the second chapter in the grade 11 syllabus for physics in CBSE. So we've, re we've reinstated these nine points. We talked about units, types of units, properties of units, system of units, measurement, precision, accuracy, errors, types of errors, combination of errors, significant figures, and finally, dimensions of physical quantities. And so that ends this episode of Mind Maps. You now we've done a bunch of other episodes on Mind Maps for grades 10, 11, and 12. So don't forget to check those out. So we've put them in separate playlists. So these playlists, are given in the description down below. Their links are given. So you can click them and you can watch these playlists for more useful videos. And if you want to join us in accessing more useful and interesting content, then don't forget to subscribe to our channel, Brain Blitz Audios. You can also hit that notifications button down below in order to receive our latest and up to date content. So until the next episode of Mind Maps, take care, stay safe. Bye-bye for now.